commence the second session of public dialogue and placing EU, Indonesia, Security and Defense Partnership. We are going to begin uh, the next session. We request that you kindly take your seat inside the auditorium. Um, a couple of housekeeping announcements for those of you that require a certificate of attending of attendance of this uh, public dialogue. Outside uh, the auditorium, uh, to your left, uh, including the auditorium to your left, there is a uh, there is a table with with the signage, a certificate. You can ask to have your certificate printed there. Uh, the certificate table also uh, is the table where where if you would like to have the slides of presentation presentation of the whole um, speaker's uh, PowerPoint earlier. You can also ask uh, the desk uh, in front. Um, I guess that's the, the housekeeping um, announcement. We are waiting for uh, five more minutes while we're preparing the, the slide so it will come out perfectly. Uh, thank you for you know, staying with us, and I'll be talking to you again.
Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we will begin our second session that will discuss the evolving challenges of modern education and crisis management, an education and a training perspective moderated by Dr. Safiya Mukibat, head of the Department of International Relations, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Please, Dr. Safiya Mukibat, to come to the stage to introduce the session. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, uh, welcome to CSIS for those of you who join us uh, for the rest of the evening and morning. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, it's a, an honor and pleasure for me to moderate um, the second session of today. And first of all, I would like to invite all of the um, distinguished speakers to come to join me to the stage. First is the General Big Policy Matupan. Silakan, Bapak, di depan. Um, second is um, Bapak um, Rio Admiral Sustiato. Bapak, silakan. The third speaker is Mr. Dave Dubois, the head of the European Civil Defense College. And the third is Mr. Amo Amuhu. Please bring the stage. the program that we have today. The second session is titled Emerging Challenges of Modern Peacekeeping and Crisis Management, uh, an Education and Training Perspective. If you uh, join us um, since the first session in the morning, um, you would um, find that um, you know, we, we also touched upon issues related to um, peacekeeping as well and how it is uh, an issue of interest of both um, the European side and also in Indonesia. Um, and one, one of the more um, important perspective of peacekeeping is of course the education and training. So uh, it's one of the issues that we in Indonesia is, um, have been trying to, to develop as well. And, and something, an issue that we are um, taking upon very seriously uh, even in the near future. Um, and to help us, uh, to guide us to uh, uh, discuss this session even further, so I've uh, introduced the four speakers. Um, I'll, um, introduce them again when they, they are about to speak. So I will begin firstly um, with discussions about you know how uh, the issue is, is discussed here in Indonesia. The first speaker is Brigadier General Fikor Sinatupan. He is the commandant of the Indonesia Peacekeeping Training Center, or as in Bahasa Indonesia we say NPP Lenin. Brigadier General Victor will um, share with us you know, his experiences in leading the NPP and how the region views uh, this part to uh, actually develop its um, peacekeeping force. Please go back. Thank <laughs> you. 
United Nations Secretary General mentioned PCP has a positive record of conflict prevention, support to political process, and sustaining peace. However, we are facing multitude challenges in safety and security. The recent report submitted by Imperial General Santos Cruz leads bear a long list of challenges referred to peacekeeper performance, including a lack of basic training and pre deployment for protect preparation. Based on that report, the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operation recognized that PT officials face significant training deficiencies. Overwhelmingly, the invested military skills poor training on issues such as weapon handling, first aid, communications, patrolling, and conduct and discipline are common. About 50% of all staff officers lack the basic military staff skills to be effective. All of this impact on peacekeepers' ability to protect civilians, which is the most important task. On the other hand, the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operation spotted another challenge such as operational targets, involvement of female peacekeepers, and the evil practice of sexual exploitation and abuse. To fight those challenges, the United Nations PTO through IPS published a comprehensive library of document templates, guidelines, and SOPs. The United Nations also has a custom document called the ORA for Operational Readiness and Insurance. Policy which speaks directly to the requirement of perform. Further, the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations taking steps to address the post battle to rectify the standard of performance on the ground by assembling a task force of officers in OMA who will be focused on force commanders' evaluation reports. So what we do, the action of Indonesian Armed Forces Center to respond to the challenges. In order to encourage capabilities of peacekeepers, the Indonesian Armed Forces Peacekeeping Center will involved in education and peacekeeping related courses. Since 2012, the Indonesian Armed Forces Peacekeeping Center has set up bilateral engagement with United Nations Integrated Training Services, ICRC, using the platform Global Peace Operation Initiative, the NPC with Canadian, ADF, POTC with Australia, and RKRF, POC with Thailand. We refer to that Indonesian Armed Forces Peacekeeping Center also submitted membership of IAPTC or International Association of Peacekeeping Training Center, AAPTC or Association of Asia Pacific Training Center, and APCN or ASEAN Peacekeeping Center Network. Currently, we manage bilateral cooperation with the European Union for peace. Hostile Environment Orders Training, United Nations Women for hosting the next FMOC, Female Military Officer Course, and Small Arms Survey for the Asia Pacific Workshop in 2019. In the area of training, the Indonesian Armed Forces Peacekeeping Center organized nine pre deployment trainings for our troops in a year for a period of 30 days. The aims of the training are to address the challenges dynamic of mission circumstances and to adjust with the current situation in peacekeeping operation mission. Our training curriculum is frequently updated to meet the requirements of modern peacekeeping operation based on core pretty common training materials or we call it uh, CPTM. Standardized generic training models or SDTM. Specialized training materials or ASPM. 
and United Nations Interdependent Manual. Peacekeepers also did tactics rehearsals related to obligation of rule of engagement, otherwise tactical incident creation and tactical response. Uh, let me give you an example that we employ uh, just uh, a week ago at the RDB Commission. To prepare the deployment on the first Indonesian rapidly deployable battalion in MONUSCO, the Indonesian Armed Forces Peacekeeping Center listed several supplementary training, such as drone handling, practical correct shooting for the day and night, satellite navigation, advanced survival and anti and bush drill. To respond to official guidance, uniform gender strategy published by the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operation, which sets targets for increasing the number of women involved in peacekeeping. We also train the female engagement team in basic infantry capabilities, medical responder and negotiation. All these trainings provide to encourage female peacekeepers capabilities in order to ensure the accomplishment of mission mandate. In, in conclusion, first, multi-dimensional multi peace, peacekeeping operation mission creates new challenges which affecting performance of peacekeepers and saving operational caveats. PDO mission has also faced another problem on involvement of female in PKO mission also sexual exploitation and abuse. Second, to examine the challenges, Indonesian Armed Forces Peacekeeping Center organized pre deployment training as mandated by United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operation based on IPS training standards. <coughs> Lastly, supplementary training is provided to peacekeepers in order to respond specific mission preparation. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Victor, um, especially for the insights into the, you know, the loss of the Indonesian peacekeeping force and the activities, very interesting activities of the peacekeeping um, training center. Um, for the second speaker, um, I'd like to invite um, Rear Admiral um, Sudistiano, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Defense Management at the Indonesian Defense University. Thank you for the time. Uh, it was to me. Uh, I will present a uh, paper to the last of the August uh, of the Malawi uh, training preparation in the Google uh, uh, This is my curriculum today. We have two important in the CV. The first is uh, that of the course. Uh, I have uh, one more year's time for service that uh, on the uh, 1st November next year, I will be retired. But uh, as letter still exists. <laughs> and the second, I have uh, experience in the peacekeeping operation in uh, uniform, uh, United Nations Drug Revision, as observer, uh, on the sick officer, uh, observer, and one uh, uh, sector commander at that time. Uh, next. Uh, here's the outline of my presentation, defining parts, uh, introduction, problem and discussion, and uh, closing back to conversion and transition. And uh, introduction. Same with the brigadier Victor, I also uh, have a video clip regarding the peacekeeping uh, operation in the Zubiara, complex, volatile, and full of challenges.
27, and 28 in Lebanon. From 1957 uh, to 2018, Indonesia has lost 36 peacekeeper. <coughs> is carrying out its duty to maintain world peace. Uh, the number of personnel sent to country boundary states is in fact not wrong because we will take out this uh, 40,000. Yeah, we will take out more than 9,000. Yeah, we will take out 40,000. Next. Problems and discussion. There are five problems and one lesson uh, learned that I will convey. Uh, problem number one hope is always higher than reality. I expected from the start the core men pre emergency training material, which is used internationally, says that the shipper must be competent and efficient while demonstrating integrity, good judgment, and knowledge of local culture and history. The mission and mandate are far from complicated with the transition from traditional to multidimensional history. We have expanded the spectrum of tasks and added provision to the field. To develop this qualities, in peacekeeping force, the peacekeeping operation department pursues three phases of training. Three development phase and development phase. Expectations are always high in peace operation, so proper training is very important for the various role of peacekeeper, the implementation of peace and mandate, and to ensure operational unity coordination and coherence. Problem number two, the need for change and preparation of rapid action task force. The need for change in peace operation has become increasingly urgent. In very complex and critical situation, every effort must be made to complement UN peacekeeping operations with rapid action capabilities that can be contributed by this country and group of countries. These forces need good skill and equipment to protect civilian and mental health. Rapid action capability need to anticipate even such as conflict in Sierra Leone, Haiti, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. By pointing out that the root cause of the conflict, as it is complicated, the peacekeeping action and surface still cannot resolve this, however, that the consideration between perfect infection is a top priority task in complex international peacekeeping operation. Problem number three is multiple and complexity of the subject. To provide concrete example, a two-week pre-development planning for police officers from the African Union and the United Nations Hybrid Mission Director Dynamic, which is based uh, on generic for pre-development planning material, includes a large number of 21 subjects such as uh, UN or uh, African Union system, for a format, humanitarian assistance until the last reform, restructuring, and rebuilding. <coughs> there is question how can anyone be expected to learn all of these subjects and then apply them in a complex setting within two weeks? Ambitious is one way to describe it. Time limit mean little room for the vision of primary contents, political exercise, feedback on the performance of identifying, deep knowledge, and skill. A facilitator from the African Center from Constructive Resources Dispute described how he was 
us to teach conflict analysis, mediation, and negotiation in two hours. This stress the conflict analysis can fill the entire degree program. So this short time negotiation is only introductory and only stress the surface. The number four of the problem is dilemma. Why are these physical training course so short? The interview practitioner said that short course were preferred because of the limited time available to professional. Financial component, of course, there is a financial component that must pay staff when registering in long-term training program. How much spending time is enough? Clearly, the skill needed to meet the international expectation of people and what they want to achieve for surpasses a simple interaction of a participant to the same level of basic understanding. But even if more extensive training is recommended, it has to be kept in mind that these people are generally deployed for one year with the potential of extension. The number, of pro the number five of problem is the OSIS combination to protect citizens. The 2015 report from the High Level Independent Panel on United Nations Peace Operation, or HIPO, identified the protection of civilians as core of human peacekeeping still not optimal. However, the POC is not standard military task. Commander and troop need learn about the requirement of special mission mandate in the POC and how with the only equipment available optimally to organize this requirement is a fertile and unfriendly and important. Next, this is very important. Let's learn about peace effectiveness training and pre-application. International Peace Support Training Center, IPSPC Innovation from Kenya. U.S. Secretary General Anthony Guterres acknowledged this in January 2018 at the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa when he stressed the need to ensure better preparation for peace forces. The point is also reinforced by a recent report on improving the security of UN peacekeeping forces, which identifies less pre deployment training as one of the main causes of death and serious injury among peacekeepers in the field. Improved peacekeeping training center in the most important countries and countries that contribute to the military and police family PCC and PCC for the UN or IU mission, most of them are developing countries that face considerable resources for them that often greater urgency. IPSTC, located in KRM, Kenya, was founded in 2001 as part of Kenya Defense Staff Police. In 2017, Kenya contributed 3,664 troops to Amisar, Somalia, and 191 troops and police to United Darfur. The development of IPSTC is able to prepare large number of personnel. This prime example of how international cooperation in this field can produce new solutions and improve the quality and effectiveness of PCP. IPSTC has also invested in research and adaptation to mission-specific challenges including violent extremism and prevalence of explosives. For example, the center has a violent action and disarmament program. The PSTC emerged in 2009 from a major 
with the International Action Mining Training Center of IMF. Since 2011, USDC has signed 15 partnerships, including with Canada and UN Women, have a network of around 70 organizations from then more than 50 countries. In addition, there's letters for them. 30 clients from the Rwandan National Police to save children who sign up for courses among 42 of us. According to the last available data, 37 of the participants were civilian, 70% were military, and 36% are police. police. Gender has been mainstream in the outfield. 70% of the total 296 staff in IPSTC of those enrolled in the course were temporary women. Still far from optimal, but this percentage was far higher than most other escaping training centers. This day, IPSTC preparing two standby force. African Standard Force and the East African Standard Force. It is no wonder of the oldest, largest, and most established peacekeeping training center of all continent. This center train also manages e-learning peacekeeping force. This conclusion, this conclusion, I will present a few points here. First, the development of the ability of future world peacekeeping force must be able to adjust to the development of the strategic environment and the condition of the future tasks that are increasingly complex, volatile, and full of challenges. Second, the prospect budget support of peacekeeping operations still uncertain and not as effective. And the third, the effort of carrying out better, more effective and efficient training and are still very much needed to improve the competence of prevent peacekeeping personnel and staff to be able to work better in the future. And the suggestion are the need for an increase in the UNDPO budget as one of which is needed in the field of education and training in order to improve the competence of personnel who will take part in the work this mission. Second, totally and continuously needed an accordion and coordination between at the NPDKO level as well as on the PKO mission that was spread out, discuss improving the potency of the peacekeeping personnel. And last, Better and more sustainable cooperation is needed in order to improve the competency of its training center for these forces and other relevant international organizations. My reference are shown in the slide. And this is the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it was particularly enlightening to learn about the, you know, the different problems that the Indonesian peacekeepers have to deal with in terms of training, including the limited time, the budget. So it's, it's very uh, enlightening to learn that. Um, looking at the problems that the Indonesian peacekeepers have with regards to education and training, I think it would be very interesting to try to compare that with the experience of Europe and how you know, they, they conduct their training and education for the peacekeepers in Europe. And to present to us uh, with that perspective is Mr. Dick Dubois, the head of the European Security Defense College. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Before I start my presentation properly, uh, I want to say just the, the following. Of all the medals and awards that I have ever received in my career as a military, because that's my background, the one that I'm most proud of is the one that I wear as a former UN peacekeeping officer. Um, 
The European Security and Defence Coalition, uh, next slide please, was created in uh, 2005, um, not to train peacekeepers, uh, not specifically, but to train people from European Union member states, from the uh, European Union institutions, on the common security and defence policy within the wider framework of the common foreign and security policy. So it is slightly broader than only training peacekeepers, uh, because we don't train UN peacekeepers, we do train a number of people who participate in our common security missions and operations, so in EU-led missions and operations. The question is then, are these peace support operations? Well, there are legalists that say, well, no, they are not. But my, course, my personal opinion is, yes, they are. They contribute to peace support. And since all of our missions are carried out under the UN mandate or on invitation by the, the state in which they are active, uh, they are de facto actually the peace support operations in the largest sense. Could you please uh, have a bit? This is a very busy slide with all of our uh, objectives. Uh, I just want to uh, take a few of them out. And, and the first one is to enhance a uh, common European security and defense culture. Basically, this means that we try to explain to people from different EU member states that the European Union as a whole has some shared interests and has to face the same threats which is not always that easy. If you're living in the south uh, west part of Europe, you may not see the world in the same way as when you were living in the northeast. Next one, please. The next one is, uh, well, this is uh, the topic of the overall uh, meeting, to provide training responding to the training needs of missions and operations. So this is a link to the, the peace speaking part. And to, we are to provide the union instances, the institutions and the agencies, and the member states with knowledgeable, pers knowledgeable personnel on common security and defense policy. Next slide. But also, we are to support the European Union partnerships, uh, European Union partnerships uh, in the field of CSDP with those countries participating in CSDP missions and operations. This is the open link to potentially uh, participation from uh, people from Indonesia, for instance, in our pre deployment training. Next slide, please. First of all, all of that we've done, you have seen the subtitle of my presentations, all of what we do is in support of the European Union's integrated approach, which basically means when we see in the European Union that a crisis is developing somewhere in the world, we look at this crisis and we look at the different things that the European Union can do to avoid that this crisis goes into open armed conflict. And we look at all those possibilities and we are one of the few actors in the world who can look at the whole range of tools. We have, similar to other big countries like the United States and potentially China as well, we have the possibility to do diplomatic actions. We have one of the largest next to the United States diplomatic services in the world. Uh, we can take economic sanctions, after all, we are the biggest trade hub in the world. Uh, we provide the biggest amount of development aid in the world. Uh, we can take actions in justice and home affairs, which means police, on trade, on climate diplomacy, and uh, we can take some conflict prevention. Uh, measures like offering uh, mediation services and support and support. Or we could do on security and defense policy uh, missions and operations. I put humanitarian assistance separately because humanitarian assistance is the one thing that the European Union never does conditionally. All of the other things we can say, look, if you don't do this or that, we will not give you any development aid. But humanitarian aid is never questioned. If uh, there is a humanitarian crisis, the EU is there to uh, help the people in 
We put this in a document called the Political Framework for Crisis Action, which is then set up to the uh, relevant bodies to make the political decision. Next slide, please. Coming back to the college, as said, created in uh, 2005 already, it carries the name Security and Defense College. Uh, it's not a defense college, so it's not purely military. And if you are looking for a big building in Brussels, where we have many classrooms and many professors doing research and everything and providing 24-7 classes, we don't have that either. Actually, our uh, real footprint in terms of number of people working at the secretary is relatively small. I'll come to that later. At the same time, we are a huge network of 132 training providers within the European Union and outside of the European Union. We have an additional five currently of interest from uh, many others. The 132 are police academies, diplomatic academies, military academies, universities, think tanks. In name, we have, as long as they provide training on common security and defense policy, it is okay. Last academic year, we have run 116 different training activities falling under 45 different types of courses currently that we are running. We have trained last year uh, 5,600 people in residential courses and additional 400 in e-learning standalone courses. In total, since 2005, approximately 24,000 alumni. And if you click, you will see that there is an error that was there to remind me. I have to say something specifically on the other thing. Uh, some of our alumni, many of our alumni, have meanwhile reached quite high level positions. To give you an example, the current Italian Minister of Defense is an ESDC alumni. The current chairman of the PSC is an ESDC alumni. So we have quite an outreach, and actually these people do come to our courses quite regularly to come and talk about what we do and what the European Union does. So we have quite, quite an outreach, that's the main message. Um, but although we were created to uh, train people from the EU member states, we also have quite a few alumni, meanwhile, from third countries, and I have a specific slide to show you later on in which regions we are uh, all active. Talking a little bit more about the, the college and how it is uh, set up, uh, it's a little bit a uh, quite unique organization. Uh, we have our own legal capacity, which means I'm allowed to run uh, my own budget, I recruit my own personnel. Uh, but we are embedded within the European Union External Action Service. I myself am a temporary agent of the External Action Service, and they provide my assistance. Nevertheless, I only report back to the member states, so it's a little bit new habit, and it also takes a little bit of the judgment to say uh, when the EAS asks me to do something, uh, when I say yes, if I have the possibility, and when I have to say no, because I don't have the resources. The legal basis is the one that you uh, see there, it's a council decision, um, and uh, of course we, as you see the little, uh, we prepare people also to the glory to the mission's operations. At the end of each of our courses, uh, participants get a certificate of attendance signed by the HRDP, by Ms. Mulroney. Okay, she only signed the first batch of trucks and she said that I had. The rest is an electronic copy. Uh, so. But they are certified by all EU 28 member states currently, which means that the certificate is recognized in all the countries and within the relevant EU institutions. Next slide. We use a learner-centric approach, and we do have to click quite often. Uh, okay, no, not so good. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, we try to provide a participant with the knowledge, with the skills, and with the level of autonomy and responsibility for the competence uh, that the person needs to do his or her work in uh, mission operation or within the uh, ministries of the member states or within the uh, institution. Uh, 
this. It's, some of it you can actually learn by using computer assisted distance learning, basically knowledge, theoretical concepts. The rest we can uh, learn through uh, presidential training, if you click. Uh, the skills, the competence, but also very much important getting to know each other. And this is very much important when you are addressing, like we do, a mixed civilian military audience. So I haven't said that, but only one third of our participants are military, one third of them are diplomats, and one third are civil servants. And strangely enough, uh, if you see a civilian walking together in the room for the first time with somebody in the uniform, whether it is a police uniform or a uh, military uniform, you see some resentment, some distance, some hesitance to, to interact, but through this course, quite quickly we bring out these various next activities. All of our trainings are under the quality control of our executive academic board, which is actually where the training institutes are represented. They provide the training, they do the training themselves, they report back to them. Next slide. And we are under the political control and guidance of the member states. 28 member states gather in what we call the steering committee. Uh, and they give us the political guidance and they give us the necessary resources to do our work. Next clip. The part in Brussels currently consists of a secretariat of 11 training managers. They are the people who assist the EAB in, uh, in the training, help organize them and uh, two people in the financial cell, and then if you have the next link, myself, which is a separate legal pillar, I'm a sole legal representative of the college, and I have an assistant uh, who also works with me, probably the extension service. Next, I said we are within the extension service, next click, and we work together with uh, relevant agencies, whether they are within the Home Security and Defense Policy, or more broadly in justice and home affairs uh, uh, ground like the border guard uh, and uh, post guard agency Frontex and the European Union agency for training of law enforcement officers etc but also the number of the, the EU institutions in the next case. Evolution in time of our training activities uh, I was training manager in the college until 2012. At that time, we had 29 courses, and there were two training managers, so we each did about 15 courses. But meanwhile, we are at 160, so the complete trend line is quite nice. I would be a chief executive officer of a civilian company. Uh, we will give you a nice bonus on this, unfortunately, why we don't have bonuses for better output. Uh, if you click my personnel resources, are more or less following the same trend. Next slide. We have an annual cycle uh, which uh, takes care of the quality management of uh, what we do. So basically, before the summer break, we start to plan the uh, activities of the next calendar year. We get priorities from the member states and we start our program. Thank you. If uh, requirements come from the European Union member states through groups that are called the European Union Military Training Group and the soon to be set up European Union Civilian Training Group. In these groups, the training requirements are analyzed, which is basically they look at what do the member states need to be trained at, they look at what already exists, they identify a gap. And then with those caps, they do go to training providers. And then we go through our cycle. And we run the courses, that's the new part. We check back on what we do. And I will report in September. We learn about the new policy developments from the external service, but also from the Commission, from the Parliament, from the uh, European Council. We take the lessons learned from our missions and operations. And uh, we see which of our curricula need to be adapted. I said we approximately have 45 active. And then we act upon that check in February, we revise those curricula that are necessary to be revised. At the latest, after two years of validation of a curriculum, it needs to be revised. This is a long cycle, but actually we have a shorter cycle, which is not an official one. The training managers 
although officially they are not responsible for the quality and are not supposed to check on the member states, they actually do and they actively ask them to do that. So if we run a course like a free quality training nine times a year, or the orientation course which we run 12 to 50 times a year, between each individual course, we also take lessons learned and we try each time to improve in terms of content, in terms of methodology, and so on. Next slide, please. Okay, that was next slide. We are embracing some new challenges. Uh, the first one, okay. uh, just last week, we have declared the initial operational capability of uh, our cyber platform for education, training, exercises, and evaluation. I still have to think very carefully about the acronym. Uh, so new uh, full operational capability will be in April next year, and uh, this is meant to step up the training on cyber security and cyber defense for the uh, personnel of the EU member states. Next, on the military side, the chairman of the military committee has asked us to develop a full, what we call, sectoral qualification framework for all the EU military. Because we have noticed, pretty much like in the UN, uh, that if you draw people from different countries, they do not necessarily have the same background. So we're trying to develop standards at, in different stages of military career of what the European Union officer, whether he comes from the United Kingdom, or from Estonia, or from Greece, should know, should be able to do, and at what level of autonomy. We already have that in place since 2013 for junior officers, but that was under a different mandate uh, in implementing the exchange of young officers under the European Initiative uh, for the exchange of young officers. Next slide. And we also take part in training uh, these analysis, professional documents uh, there of the European Union civilian training group and the European Union military training group. That takes quite some work. Uh, we are actually unofficially often asked to support the external action service with a training view on different policy documents and we have uh, actually quite been successful in influencing from time to time some documents. Next slide. Where are we? Uh, we are active with partners. Um, our core task again is to train member states and EU institutions. But uh, if you click through, uh, we work very much with the United Nations uh, in terms of they provide trainers for our courses, we invite them to our courses, we share standards with them from time to time, especially when we are talking about things like heat training, the hostile environment awareness training. Uh, next please. We do regular courses with the uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, actually, we do one per year, alternatingly in China and in Brussels, uh, and alternatingly a high-level seminar addressing decision makers. There's one in two weeks, I guess, in Beijing, uh, and an orientation seminar, which will be next year in Beijing, and then after that we come back to Brussels for an orientation seminar and a high-level seminar. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, um, we are obviously active in uh, the European Union neighborhood. We provide training for the West of Balkan countries uh, and uh, for the Eastern Partnership countries. So those countries in the neighborhood of the European Union with two different uh, goals. First of all, to bring them closer to the European Union, especially for the Western Balkan countries, which have quite a good uh, possibility to join the EU in the next, I don't know, three, four, five years, ten years, depending on how quickly the negotiations go and on the Eastern Partnership countries. Most of that effort is not to actively try to get them into the European Union, but to get them to act together with the European Union and to teach them how we work, how uh, they could cooperate better with us. Next slide, please. We have done so far uh, two courses with uh, South America and Mexico, uh, twice in Madrid. Uh, the first one very uh, successful with all 10 South uh, American states present. The second one, for political reasons, Venezuela was not uh, 
represented. But next year we have already an invitation from Colombia to do it in uh, Colombia in the region. So similar to what uh, I talked about in the next one, uh, we have a similar uh, series of courses going with ASEAN. And earlier this week we have actually done the fourth new ASEAN seminar for security and defense. Uh, the first one actually in the region, and I must say I was very, very uh, happy with the results of that seminar and with the very active participation from the uh, representatives of eight out of the ten ASEAN member states and from ASEAN Secretariat. Next slide, please. We are also active in uh, two organizations, the International Association of Peace Training Centers and its European equivalent. European uh, Association of Peace Training Centers and then the places on the map are simply where the last uh, conference was where we participated actually the IAPTC uh, did its latest conference I think four or three weeks ago uh, in New Zealand unfortunately uh, I have another activity in Brussels uh, so I can go but uh, it's also a little bit fun to travel to four conference uh, Next, That's uh, the end of my presentation. I draw your attention to two hyperlinks. Uh, the first one is uh, up on the official ESDC uh, website as part as the EAS website, uh, where you can find uh, our course offer for the next six months normally. Uh, you can also find some of our handbooks which we have made uh, in the electronic format and uh, the curricula, if you're interested to see uh, what they are about, you can find them there. You could also register on the Goalkeeper platform. The Goalkeeper platform has a part for Schoolmaster. In Schoolmaster, we register all of our training activities, but also other training activities by other providers on uh, European security and defense. With this, I thank you for your attention. For the um, description about the ESDCs, um, particularly interesting about the integrated approach that is done um, ESDC, and particularly the acknowledging the new challenges that exist in terms of education and training. So, looking at the experiences in both Indonesia and then uh, in Europe, uh, and acknowledging that you know challenges exist, I think the biggest question now is you know how to how do we respond to these challenges. Um, and in particular, you know, how do we enhance the, the performance of the peacekeepers? Um, and to try to answer this, uh, this question, um, we have the last speaker, which is Mr. Amo uh, Amu, who is an independent expert, uh, formerly uh, a coordinating officer of the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operation. So that's right. Um, thank you very much uh, to uh, CSIS for the invitation and thank you uh, for the opportunity of addressing uh, everybody here. So I am, um, well, I, I must uh, make two questions here. I'm the last speaker, so I hope everybody is uh, still um, you know, awake. And, uh, and I must say that uh, some of my um, points actually have already been addressed by the, the, the generals here. Right? So I'll try to I'll try to probably uh, change a little bit my presentation uh, as I go, so uh, uh, please bear with me. Uh, this presentation is going to be around uh, four points. Uh, I will be looking at the current uh, landscape of the human peacekeeping. Uh, I will also uh, uh, walk you through uh, uh, some of the key reform areas of uh, how to enhance uh, peacekeeping. And uh, one focus uh, I will make is about actually, actually addressing capability gaps uh, through uh, training and capacity building uh, measures. And finally, I will also uh, look at Indonesia, but I will also look at the broader region, and I will try uh, to uh, uh, bring in a regional dimension to this uh, uh, discussion as well. Uh, with this, shall I do it myself? Yes. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, UN peacekeeping is still a very uh, relevant uh, international uh, tool when it comes to uh, international peace and security. However, how it's been uh, already uh, addressed by some speakers, 
there are uh, indeed a number of challenges which uh, undermine the uh, ability of uh, peacekeeping missions to uh, fully deliver on their uh, mandates. Um, UN peacekeeping has actually served 70 years uh, this year. Uh, the first uh, mission was deployed in 1948 in UNSO, uh, uh, which is the truce uh, supervision uh, mission in the Middle East. And um, at the moment, we are actually uh, we are having uh, 14 uh, peacekeeping uh, missions uh, operating, seven of which are in Africa. And uh, we uh, uh, come back to that in the fact that there is a linguistic element which needs to be taken into consideration when you think in terms of capacity building and training. So uh, I would uh, actually concentrate on the big five, so-called big five missions, which are uh, South Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, uh, Mali, and uh, Darfur. Um, as we have already touched upon uh, briefly, those missions are basically uh, characterized by two uh, sets of uh, issues, complex mandates, uh, when uh, you have no peace agreement in place, or uh, no peace agreement to monitor, uh, sometimes lack of cooperation on the part of the host uh, governments, no clear exit uh, strategy, uh, no adequate uh, resources, and uh, as well the so-called uh, Christmas uh, tree mandate, which is uh, something the current UN uh, SG uh, has been uh, used as a label to uh, qualify um, when the peacekeeping mission is given too many tasks uh, at the moment, only in South Sudan uh, has been uh, given 209 tasks. So it tells you something about uh, sometimes the uh, really unrealistic um, um, tasks that, uh, that may come with such a complex uh, mandate. When it comes to uh, difficult environments, we heard a lot about the asymmetric uh, threats. Uh, about uh, the proliferation on the, of non-state uh, actors such as uh, criminal, uh, transnational criminal networks, armed groups, uh, but also, um, but also uh, extremist uh, ideologies. So with this, uh, I will uh, quickly uh, introduce the Action for Peacekeeping, which has been also mentioned by uh, one of the speakers uh, earlier which is this initiative launched by the UN Secretary General and which is, uh, because obviously the challenges I've just mentioned have been uh, diagnosed and they are well known. Uh, there was the HIPO report back in 2015, which is the High Independent uh, Panel for Considerations, which uh, um, made a number of recommendations, how to enhance this speaking. And then there was the Cruz uh, report, the former force commander of Cruzco, who has been looking specifically at uh, peacekeeping fatalities. And both those reports have, if you wish, culminated in this action for peacekeeping, which is a set of um, 20 commitments for uh, the international community across seven themes. And I will uh, quickly walk you through uh, those. So if you look, I mean, this is my, my own creation. It's a table which basically uh, lists some of those uh, key reform areas when it comes to enhancing uh, peacekeeping. Uh, on the left, you've got the uh, uh, recommendations from the Action for Peace, and on the right, you've got the uh, recommendations from the Cruz uh, report. So uh, reaffirming progressive of politics is something uh, I mean, I've, uh, I've touched upon about the complex uh, mandates those missions are uh, operating uh, within uh, and uh, adapting to new threats, uh, which are the two uh, you know, main uh, challenges I've uh, started uh, with. But now, if you look into uh, number three and number four, for instance, you've got the so-called uh, protection cluster, which is on the one hand, um, how to make sure that these keepers are safe and secure so that they can actually uh, uh, perform their related tasks and how can they then uh, protect civilians, which is uh, usually like one of the central tasks uh, they are interested with. Um, on this, there are, I mean, obviously, uh, pre deployment training is, a, is a, a critical implementing tool uh, because it will be about making sure that you've got well trained, well equipped, and commanded to deliver uh, peacekeepers. So uh, here, I mean, the two uh, protection dimensions are 
uh, very important to, uh, to bear in mind. Um, but actually, when it comes to um, avoiding fatalities, the Cruz report has made an interesting uh, um, point, which is that an observation, which is that uh, sometimes by uh, being inactive, uh, you put yourself in a, a possibly in a dangerous uh, situation. And that's where he uh, recommends that uh, there is a, uh, you know, an effort to changing uh, mindset and the posture when it comes to receiving uh, missions. And that's, of course, a little contentious because uh, sometimes you've got TCCs uh, which are uh, not uh, willing to take additional risks. But I mean, this can across as a very uh, strong uh, recommendation from that uh, report. It can be, for instance, um, pushing the combat uh, tonight or, uh, or, uh, or um, um, or actually going where the threat is, uh, but also taking advantage of the uh, technological superiority uh, that the peacekeepers should have normally vis a vis a our groups. So, this uh, changing a mindset and posture is, uh, uh, is another important uh, key reform. Um, improving capacity, which has to do with equipment, but also with, uh, with skills. Um, here, uh, the, the UN has in place uh, three deployment uh, visits, um, which is looking at the serviceability of uh, equipment, but uh, which is increasingly going to be uh, looking at the operational readiness of those. So that it's uh, one thing to have the proper equipment in place, but it's another to, look, to make sure that uh, peacekeepers uh, are, uh, are in the right uh, mindset uh, to deliver on their uh, tasks. Um, obviously, conduct uh, of personnel, which is the conduct and discipline, and uh, accountability are two other uh, very important dimensions. Conduct and discipline being about the zero tolerance when it comes to uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, and accountability being about uh, the, the, the call on the, on, the, on the part of the UN to uh, ensure that uh, any um, attacks against the peacekeepers uh, be properly uh, dealt with, so that the perpetrators are actually uh, brought to justice, and that uh, requires, uh, of course, um, in most cases, a cooperation uh, on the part of the host uh, governments. All of that, if uh, it is uh, properly uh, put in place, should uh, lead to the uh, effective performance of uh, peacekeepers. And here, just to say that uh, increasingly reports of underperformance, uh, I think the Brigadier General referred to the, um, uh, to the Force Commander Evaluation Reports. This is something which is going to uh, become more and more um, a rule and not the exception. Um, Underperformance uh, cases uh, to be uh, duly reported and, uh, and the remaining action uh, to be taken. And this goes uh, hand in hand with the so called uh, caveats, uh, which are those uh, restrictions, hidden or official uh, restrictions or red lines that sometimes uh, through contributing countries also uh, uh, put uh, uh, in their uh, memorandum of understanding uh, with the uh, United Nations prior to uh, deployment. The last uh, two uh, dimensions are uh, enhancing uh, partnerships, which is very relevant for us today because it's about uh, associating uh, regional organizations and sub-regional organizations, uh, something which the, the, the previous uh, Secretary General in the current one are very keen to, uh, to, to explore. And finally, sustaining peace, which basically goes back to the fact that peacekeeping is only one uh, moment, uh, if you wish, in the timeline of peace and security. Before that, you've got the uh, uh, conflict prevention efforts, which need to be uh, uh, taken, into, uh, take, uh, taken into consideration, and then the uh, conflict resolution and peace delivery. So it's, uh, it's a full uh, spectrum we are uh, actually looking at. Now, I will be uh, quickly uh, walking you through three um, innovative concepts which uh, I believe uh, should be uh, taken into consideration when we talk about addressing capability gaps. Uh, by capability, we mean those uh, high capacity rare assets which actually uh, allow peacekeeping missions to deliver uh, on their mandated tasks. And, uh, and you would be surprised, I mean, uh, uh, the, the wider spectrum of things, the uh, key can actually cover. 
um, transport, um, uh, aviation is a, is, a, is a critical one. I mean, peacekeeping missions, especially the, the big five uh, I started with, are in countries where infrastructure is very poor, uh, the remote locations which cannot be reached by, uh, by air. Yet, uh, there's been a, a number of cases where uh, peacekeeping missions were not able to deploy uh, in any manner because of lack of uh, uh, air assets. Uh, and here I would like to uh, um, maybe uh, add to this uh, C-130, which uh, is uh, currently in uh, Inus Mamani. And that's an interesting initiative which uh, is uh, to the credit of uh, five European countries. Um, uh, I don't want to uh, miss any of them. We've got uh, Norway, Sweden, Portugal, Denmark and Belgium. And they, uh, they, they, they sort of uh, introduced this uh, new uh, concept of uh, rotational of uh, air assets. Uh, and this is actually uh, a great tool to help uh, you know, relieve the strain on the TCC, which cannot uh, maybe uh, you know, deploy a C-130 for, uh, for one or two years. But I mean, they are looking at uh, periods of the three uh, to six months and each country takes a, takes a rotation. So that's, that's uh, the first uh, interesting uh, area to, uh, um, to, to, to consider. Um, then uh, what I've got, uh, and this is also actually called a small pledge, this uh, rotation of uh, uh, aviation uh, assets. Uh, another um, um, capability which is uh, fundamental uh, for this meeting is engineering. Uh, engineering is crucial actually in the startup uh, phase of the uh, peacekeeping mission, precisely for the reasons I, I, I just uh, described. Uh, lack of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure. You need uh, air lift so that you can uh, take off and, uh, and, um, and land. Uh, you need uh, sanitation, you need a cab for the peacekeepers. And this is uh, often uh, a capability which is uh, lacking. And here I just want to uh, uh, highlight uh, yet again another interesting initiative, which is the so-called Triangular Partnership uh, Project, ATEC, uh, which stands for uh, African Rapid Development Engineering Capacities. And that's a triangular partnership between uh, Japan, the UN, and, uh, and the TCCs in Africa. And I'm, uh, I'm told actually this uh, initiative has actually uh, come to uh, Asia, right? Yeah. To, to Indonesia. Yes, uh, Vietnam at the moment. Uh, Vietnam at the moment. Yeah. So uh, and that actually has proven a very uh, good uh, model, and um, it's one of those uh, enabling capabilities which is uh, crucial for, for the UN. So uh, maybe uh, also uh, an area of uh, um, you know where uh, willing countries or organizations uh, may want to, to, to contribute. Uh, and the last. Um, the last uh, concept, uh, which has to do with uh, other specific capabilities, is on the one hand uh, the need to uh, recruit uh, additional female engagement. And uh, uh, I was actually uh, glad to hear about uh, Indonesia doing uh, very well in terms of uh, women engagement uh, teams. Um, the targets that the, uh, the, the UN has set are 15% uh, for um, troops and 20 for military and staff officers. Uh, so Indonesia may actually be uh, about uh, to reach these targets, but that's not the case for most uh, TCCs. And another uh, critical uh, capability is the linguistic one. 70% um, of uh, troops currently deployed uh, amongst the 14 uh, peacekeeping missions are in francophone environments. And, uh, and um, often uh, those uh, uh, troops do not speak the language, which um, may be problematic, I mean, for uh, uh, I mean, on many levels, but uh, uh, probably the most important one in my eyes is the fact that the local population uh, wants, uh, when they want to interact with, uh, with the two different countries, cannot do so. And this is, of course, not conducive to uh, trust and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and just, you know, a normal communication. So uh, that's uh, definitely another uh, area where um, uh, training and capacity building uh, would certainly be welcome on the part of the uh, United Nations. And, uh, and my final slide is about the uh, regional dimension. Uh, we have uh, Indonesian particulars uh, here represented. Um, 
when I, um, in, my, in my last video when I said that I was actually uh, dealing with uh, operational partnerships between the DKO and the regional organizations. And at the time, I was saying I was uh, mostly busy with the European Union, not so much with uh, ASEAN, but uh, now I'm looking more closely at uh, what uh, uh, ASEAN uh, uh, countries are contributed, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something which I should have paid more attention to. At the, at the moment, uh, so we, we saw figures about Indonesia, and eight uh, Asian countries out of ten are contributing to the uh, missions for a total of 4,500 troops, which are deployed across nine missions. Uh, so it's a majority of missions, uh, which actually represents five percent of the all uh, troops that are currently uh, deployed in the world. So it's uh, it's, it's uh, significant. But maybe most uh, importantly, and that's uh, just uh, my days, the uh, food photos I'm uh, throwing here, uh, the, the peer to peer learning is something which I, I, I believe I mean, the, uh, the EU has been, uh, has been uh, doing. Uh, in Unity, for instance, we've got, uh, we've got uh, Finland and, um, and uh, Ireland who've been uh, actually uh, doing uh, something. And, yeah, and they did a uh, similar uh, thing that uh, Brunei and Malaysia have been doing. Yeah. Uh, so it would be interesting actually to, you know, to, to make some comparative uh, 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 evaluation of, of uh, how this experience uh, uh, has been uh, going. And, um, and lastly, yeah, and, uh, I'm talking about eight countries, so big contributors such as uh, uh, Indonesia, we've got also new powers such as Vietnam, which is increasingly uh, being present uh, in, uh, in peacekeeping. So I'm definitely uh, interested to be uh, looking at uh, uh, experiences and the sharing of, uh, of uh, knowledge. Uh, and I'm hopefully you know, uh, reaching a point where uh, this can be a mutually beneficial operation for uh, groups of countries uh, within ASEAN, but also between ASEAN and the EU, and uh, overall uh, uh, helping uh, uh, enhance uh, the performance of the UN PCP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Abu. Um, thank you for you know, explaining to us the current landscape, and I think also of all, you know, how can we reform uh, peacekeeping. Um, presenting you know, some interesting innovative you know, concepts for addressing the um, critical capability gap, which is, I think, um, one of the main issues in responding to the challenges that we discussed earlier. So we had um, four, I think, a um, very interconnected and comprehensive discussion about um, PCP and basically how to respond to challenges. Um, I'd like now to open um, the opportunity for some questions and comments um, from the floor. Um, there are some microphones uh, around the room, so I have one over here. Um, I'll, take, I'll start with you, sir. Um, if there's any more, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah. No, 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 Thank you for the opportunity given. Uh, my name is Amir Khan from the PRC Inc., uh, local community-based uh, defense media. I'd like to answer your question uh, regarding your SKF, the information about the SKF qualification. So uh, regarding the SKF for the EU, uh, because of course with the, many of the uh, members of the EU is also member of NATO, the will hit flag already become a redundancy uh, with the NATO requirement. Uh, and, and in general, in regard to the NATO education and training, do you read that uh, does the ESDC try to synchronize your material to avoid this kind of redundancy uh, in your training materials for the personnel that being trained? Uh, I think that's a good question. Thank you very much. Second question. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, uh, what we want to cover to say that I was uh, interested to hear about ESDC, which I didn't know about, and it's a great opportunity to, to learn about its uh, existence. Uh, I'm sure not anyone will be My question is, is really a question for, for anybody, because all of you, or most, have mentioned the role of women and females. And uh, maybe you can elaborate this a little bit, because it's, uh, it's really something that's, which, that everybody speaks about. 
uh, it's in all the policies, it's not so cool from our Indonesian uh, colleagues, uh, but also uh, from the principal point of view, what should be done, what can be done, what are the, the challenges. It's one topic that I mentioned a conference we will be organizing next year, that's one topic that will be into it, so that's why I'm interested to hear your perspective. One more. Well, uh, thank you to, to all the speakers and the later, very interesting panel. Uh, thank you to Alexandro, who just uh, put the question on my head. <laughs> <laughs> Which was uh, about India, uh, the rare assets uh, that Arno has mentioned, and I was uh, very interested to see that between uh, linguistic rare assets and uh, engineering and uh, air capacity assets. We have these key assets of uh, women peacekeeper with quite bold uh, targets, 15 and 20 persons targets of women peacekeepers. So two questions to our panelists, the Indonesian one and the EU one, um, and um, I don't with the good questions of Alexander uh, Fed. So, uh, two, two questions. Uh, are those targets easily achievable? Is that something we need to reach? And if not, uh, what is the part of training in the solution to uh, reach the, this target? Is a training, specific training on uh, gender issues and, and to um, promote or facilitate uh, the uh, participation of women in peacekeeping is trained part of the solution is that a key element or there are other reasons that explain that these 15 and 20 uh, person uh, targets are um, difficult to reach. And then um, a question also on, on this rare asset, uh, women engagement. Where do we stand to know exactly in uh, Indonesian peacekeeping? Uh, in terms of percentage of um, of the employment of um, women peacekeepers, I understand that you have uh, very good assets, not to be Lebanon, you have a uh, woman police contingent, which is quite famous. But what is your overall picture? And the same question, question to my EU colleagues. I remember that in 2009, we were one of the co drafters of the first EU action plan to implement uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. And that's a big, one of the three P's of participation that we made bold uh, plans to increase uh, women participation in uh, European Union crisis management operation mission. Where do we stand now? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take just three questions for the first round. If there's any more, then I'll probably open on the next one. Uh, but Victor, if you would uh, address the question about you know female peacekeepers, and how do we stand in Indonesia at the moment? And you know, if, are there challenges to attract more female peacekeepers, and how are the training? Thank you, Mike. Uh, concerning the, the female uh, peacekeepers, currently the percentage of female. Uh, say military in our uh, military is only five percent out of the one hundred percent. So from these five percent, the initial female peacekeepers, we only contribute to our peacekeepers three percent. So I don't know. We encourage them to um, to, to, to to apply for peacekeepers, but. They still reluctant, maybe because of women uh, tend to keep uh, family first, then the duty comes. So it is uh, very hard to allure them to join the peacekeepers uh, to be sent to other countries. Um, we, we, we plan to have a Peacekeeping training uh, uh, seminar next year for female here in Indonesia sometime in December, November. November. Um, cooperating with New Indonesian from New York. So it will be held here. We will invite from various countries to join us. Um, 
We also uh, have, uh, say, our uh, opinion how to to attract them. We send our um, officers from all various institutions, say, to to provide uh, to uh, to provide here. Over there is a navy headquarters and air force in. in um, uh, from Jakarta as well as in Slytherin uh, Academy. We send them and we explain them it is very effective uh, an opportunity to serve with many nations. But until now, we don't have yet the result. Uh, in my opinion, maybe we can, because we have a very small number of the women in the ACP. Maybe we can uh, uh, mix like in the European to be in two countries or maybe in other countries to send them uh, one mission. And uh, of course, why uh, women uh, we should increase because in the in the conflict area uh, in the sexual protection legality for the women and children. That that means we we should increase uh, the participation of the the woman in the principle. And uh, also we can uh, learn from the already in the Kenya because they have a training uh, special for the woman, for the woman, for the military uh, woman. Maybe we can uh, sell it each other. Thank you. Uh, before we ask a little bit further, I mean, you mentioned there's only about five percent um, of women and, and female peacekeepers at the moment, maybe three percent deployed, right? Is there any specific training for them that's different to the regular training in the Oh, for uh, that training, we do we we do not differ them from the, the main. So everyone is equal. Everyone is um, trained with the, the same method, the same uh, methodology. Also, if we send, say, the, the male peacekeepers to the bush, then we send also the female. Uh, last time when the United Nations from New York coming to, uh, they call it the PGP, 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 PC, before the peacekeepers to be sent out to the mission area, uh, they are they were very satisfied when uh, this uh, officer from New York observed that the Indonesian female peacekeepers are ready to combat whether in, uh, in the jungle or in the um, uh, town area. Thank you, Mark. Um, Mr. So Duong, if you could have the experience of, of um, you know, your training center and how you know, you're trying to attract more female officers um, to participate in this event. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I think we have to uh, differentiate between the military peacekeepers uh, and the uh, people who are going to the civilian uh, mission. Um, in the most of the European Union armies, female personnel is around 10, maybe 12 percent personnel. So it's a little bit higher uh, than here. Uh, and this is also reflected in uh, the number of females in our peacekeeping operations. And actually, in the, I, I do not have the, the, all the numbers for all the new member states uh, in head, but I know the notion that actually uh, they are overrepresented in the uh, peacekeeping operations. The situation for the police, for instance, is quite different. Uh, again, the Belgian figures, last year 50% of the police officers that were recruited were female. They're not 50% of the overall police population because they haven't uh, been recruited in, in such numbers uh, in the past. Uh, but they, they represent a far higher uh, percentage. Uh, what I, I don't have the overall figures for, for the civilian deployment, but I do see that, for instance, in my big point of training, which is uh, mostly focusing on the civilian deployments, approximately 30% of the participants in our free deployment training are female. So that gives you a good indication of uh, the number of female personnel in our civilian missions. Um, 
We also have a, a very specific goal uh, on the heads of mission in the, uh, the, so the propositions. Uh, there should be 50% females uh, in uh, those positions. Uh, we reached that actually at a certain point of time about two years ago, but it's gone down again. So uh, there are a little bit less female uh, heads of mission than there are male, but uh, it is a clear comment that we have set up and that we try to achieve. Uh, that is most of what I wanted to say on, on, on the general issue. Um, we do have some courses specific on uh, the implications of human security council resolution 1325 and 1865 and subsequent resolutions. Uh, so we do try to uh, integrate that aspect also as a horizontal aspect in our other training. Those training play a role in trying to uh, get those figures up higher. It's very difficult if uh, you're already representing the population that you have in place in your official, your official uh, officials or your member states to get that up even higher. So I think the role of, of training is more on awareness the uh, training on what are the implications of uh, gender on, on missions and operations, on gathering intelligence, on interacting with the local population, than, than it is on uh, increasing the number of personal people. There was also another point, the first question about the possible question of redundancy in the Yes, that's a very good question actually. Uh, for once, the European Union has uh, outrun the uh, NATO friends uh, quite the honest way in Brussels. Uh, which doesn't often happen quite often. The NATO is, is developing faster and faster and we are very good them. But um, on sexual qualification framework the situation is the following. So I said in 13 in 2013 we have uh, created a partial uh, qualification framework only for the basic bank of officer. And uh, we were given the task to do it uh, for the rest of uh, the, the, the officers' ranks uh, in 2016, and we actually the lack of personnel only started working on it earlier this year. The situation in NATO is that they are currently doing a feasibility study, whether or not they would be able to create such a framework. So we are approximately five years ahead of them. Um, Nevertheless, we do coordinate with them, and, and if you're ahead, what usually happens is the other guy catches up because he profits from your work. So we do exchange what we have. We have uh, transmitted uh, the, uh, the qualification of the least qualification framework that we have. We have shared that with NATO through the NATO training group. I have myself participated together with my subject matter expert uh, to a meeting of NATO training group in uh, Hungary in October, and uh, we will continue to, uh, to share uh, information between the groups to try to make it as, uh, as coherent and consistent as possible. There is a slight difference. Um, the qualification framework that we are using is fully in line with the European qualification framework, which is used in the European higher education area throughout the uh, 46 countries that participate in that, so the member states and uh, a couple of others. Uh, whilst NATO is more looking into a system uh, which is more aligned with, uh, with the US approach. Uh, so, nevertheless, that's only a matter of translation. What we do want to avoid uh, is things that what happens uh, in language, uh, where you have the uh, SLP, so the NATO uh, reference framework for language proficiency, uh, which is completely incompatible with the European Union's uh, framework for language referencing. You cannot make automatic grades. So what we want to do uh, in, in terms of the SQF is to make certain that we do that translation between different systems already from the very beginning, so that, you, that they are fully compatible without being the same. So we try to avoid redundancy, we try to avoid duplication when it's possible, but we also need to take into account that there are only 22 countries which are in both organizations and that there are six or seven in the other organization. So, Mr. I'll go back to the gender question. I mean, you mentioned the fact that 15% and 20% 
are these standards achievable on the with the question? Before actually uh, answering one, I think they are achievable and why they are important. I think was a very uh, good question because actually uh, in the context of peacekeeping missions, uh, surveys have shown that um, women peacekeepers, uh, peacekeepers patrolling uh, are not going to be or are going to be perceived as less as a threat uh, uh, as men uh, by the population. And uh, in Congo, for instance, in Eastern Congo, there were studies who have very clearly made that, uh, that observation. So in terms of um, um, restoring trust and confidence, uh, as I was saying, I mean, there, is a, there are several ways of doing that, but certainly I mean, having women peacekeepers is well perceived on the part of the local population. So uh, and I think that's a, that's a very important uh, element. Uh, in terms of um, training, uh, how can, uh, uh, what can training do in that uh, respect? Um, I don't know, you know I, I always go back to the, the sharing of uh, experience, um, having uh, maybe uh, some of the, 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 the part of the women of the who served in, uh, in the visiting missions, but uh, Malaysian and uh, you know, from, the, from the region, and having them just maybe share their experience, uh, and, uh, and that would possibly, you know, uh, um, you know uh, convince other women to join. So I guess uh, the, the sharing of experience coming from women uh, would, uh, would actually be uh, helpful. Um, and, uh, and on that, uh, when it comes to the, the regional dimension again, I know that in Lusco, for instance, there is a four police units composed 100% of uh, women from Bangladesh. Uh, so um, so there is, a, there is a, the element of the temptation sometimes to just uh, embed a number of women within uh, you know, a company or uh, women, but I mean, you could also think of, uh, you know, for me, like one of the person women. I know that Bangladesh has been doing it, and again, I mean, seeing those uh, women uh, patrolling the streets of uh, Kinshasa, they were received, uh, perceived uh, in a much more uh, positive manner uh, by the population than men. So, whether it is achievable, I, I don't know. I, uh, yes, maybe, but I mean, uh, there are certain number of steps that need to be taken also in terms of uh, raising awareness, but uh, eventually, yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Okay, I have one. Um, if there's any other? Okay, can you please uh, address who you want to ask the question to? Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Mohamed Pabi uh, from CSIS. So the first question I would like to ask Mr. Arno uh, in regards to the, the previous question as well regarding uh, the gender as well. Uh, so my question begins by starting uh, quoting what uh, Patrick first stated before. Uh, the biggest obstacle for recruiting women because women sometimes prefer to take care of family members compared to joining the PCP operation. And then my question being, uh, what do you think, I mean, in your perspective, uh, what are the incentives that could be provided by the government or the international organization to, uh, to foster or, uh, the, the number of uh, women speakers. And then uh, the second question will be I would like to ask uh, Patrick Pan, also Paso Lispian, uh, in regards to um, a lot of wisdom and also working language. So basically, Indonesia always emphasizes about uh, the importance of uh, local wisdom here. Uh, however, I want to ask about uh, the material of peacekeepers, uh, training, peacekeeping training itself. So, uh, is there any kind of training uh, to enhance like the understanding of local wisdom to, to, uh, in regards to the area that we are going to be deployed there? And also, is there any, uh, any additional training for improving uh, like working language? Because uh, as uh, Mr. Arnold said, that sometimes work language uh, becomes a uh, biggest uh, obstacle, a, a big obstacle for I mean for interacting with uh, the local community as well as with uh, other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last chance for one more question. Yes, this is uh, can we get a microphone here? Thank you for a really excellent presentations. And um, my uh, question goes um, um, specifically to the field of, of the bilateral agreements that you have. Um, uh, General, I heard that you mentioned that, that uh, your center has 
specific bilateral agreement on cooperation on the training with some partners, for example, Canada and Australia. And uh, I was wondering if you could give us some examples of what concretely that cooperation um, is about. And in particular then, if you also see some special potential for similar cooperation with the European Union. Thank you. Okay, I'll start with Mr. Arnold, there are still more questions about the penal papers. Well, now that in the gender aspect, I know I should get some good questions. Um, the, um, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, I, I, I think it's a very much a personal choice. I mean, I, um, I, that's why I was, uh, in my previous answer, I was referring to, uh, you know, sharing my experience, uh, people who then peacekeepers addressing other uh, women, you know, serving in, uh, in national armies. And then, I mean, based on uh, the discussion, uh, they may decide or not decide to you know, join the, the peacekeeping mission. So I, it's just a matter of making information available, uh, and, and then it's, it's a personal uh, choice. But just uh, I'm taking the opportunity also to, 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 to quickly touch on another uh, dimension, which I, I think I, I very briefly touched upon, was the, um, the specialist uh, niche of uh, expertise. Uh, and that goes back to the, the various uh, training centers. Maybe one way of approaching the issue, again, at the, at the regional dimension, uh, would be to have uh, one or two of the, you know, the, 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 the peacekeeping uh, uh, training center specialized in, uh, in uh, training women peacekeepers. Uh, and so that would become the niche for one or two country, you know, that would need to engage uh, on this guy. Uh, then you've got, uh, you know, uh, an attack, you've got uh, capturing uh, uh, IV, you've got many uh, different, uh, you know, uh, um, niche uh, of expertise. But I think that could be just, uh, just an idea to consider. Okay. Well, there are several questions to you. First is, you know, you're having more details about the training. Uh, this is from part of the the part of the training for uh, we, we train our peacekeepers before they go into the mission area. For example, different mission and di different uh, attitude to, to train them. Say, if we send our troops to Sudan, we uh, train them the Arabic language. It is a must for all the peacekeepers. Uh, we cooperated with the Ministry of Education back in until we have the, the department over there. Um, secondly, we also teach them the, the, the local wisdom of the students, how they should react to the Sudanese people. And also, before departing to the mission area, we also teach them the culture. The culture event also from Indonesia. We bring our culture to, to the mission area. So uh, speaking with culture event, it is more easy to speak with the local rather than you show up with your uniform. And also, <coughs> uh, apart from that, the Indonesian strategy is uh, to reach and uh, win the mind of the people. Uh, we call it SIMI or Healing Space for Health. Uh, uh, we call it uh, acronym. Um, say if the United Nations would like to, to build a mosque, then my troops observe if it is need by the people. If it is not need by the people, then we change. We ask the people what should we build. <coughs> then after that, we ask the United Nations. The people out there, they don't need most. They need school. Then we, we build the school. The, the people in Sudan very uh, happy what we do the people of Sudan. Then if we send our troops say to, to Congo, it's totally different the, 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 the culture in Congo and the culture in Sudan. Then we teach the, the our uh, peacekeepers to go to Sudan in uh, Francophone, in the uh, in, uh, French language. This also collaboration with uh, the Department of uh, um, Education in Central. Also, we teach them how to, to greet the, the local, 
Also, they in, in Congo, they speak, I, I think, Swahili. We speak a little bit of uh, Swahili languages. So this uh, kind of uh, approach, I think, um, more um, uh, achievable by the local. Um, I think this is answer your question. Uh, to Miss Clara, uh, the, the cooperation between Indonesia Fishing Center and other countries, say from um, US, we have a certain cooperation with Indonesia. Yesterday I just uh, opened a, a, we call it a civics, US civic uh, course. It, 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 the period is only two weeks. Um, with uh, GPOI, we have five, six, uh, six anybody operation with uh, GPOI from the US. With Canadian, we have two, three. We have, we have three anybody operation with Canadian. It is all funded by Canadian, but the GPOI is uh, co chair the fund. Um, with um, Australia, we do have a joint cooperation with Australia, we call it Garuda Kukobara Exercise. Um, next year, we will have the ADMM Plus. Uh, it, it will consist of 18 countries, if I understand. 18 countries, and the, 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 the peacekeepers will be around 400 in, in uh, November next year. Um, we also plan to have a, a training with um, Russia and uh, Laos. It is in the mind action how how to limit uh, the, the, the the mining program. Uh, with the Asian countries, we have a cooperation with um, uh, Thailand. We call it uh, Ayara Garuda. We already uh, have a joint training in Thailand as well as in Indonesia. In Indonesia, we just did um, last October for a three weeks. Uh, other than that, we also have a cooperation. We, we call it uh, Peacekeeping Center Cooperation. Uh, we have the International Peacekeeping Coalition, which, which was held in Seoul. It was in uh, June. And the last one, we had a uh, Peacekeeping Center meeting in uh, uh, New Zealand, Auckland. So, other than that, in ASEAN, ASEAN is only starting. There is no real partnership yet, but the uh, the is already there. I think that's how I answer your question. That's how I can see about the local statement. Uh, actually, the, the principal, the teacher, uh, need the update information from the fields. The team, the, the peacekeeper, to be back, should inform, give information to the team because this is very important. What uh, the people need for next? This is from the Okay, um, thank you. Um, I, I believe this will be a very interesting um, um, discussion that we had. I personally learned um, a lot about the, the, the dynamics uh, in terms of the uh, PCP, especially from the Indonesian perspective. Um, um, I would like to have made any um, conclusion whatsoever, but I really do look forward to, you know, more discussions um, on this topic um, in, in the near future, because um, next year Indonesia starts its non permanent membership at the UN Security Council, and I believe, you know, upon the um, election as a non permanent membership, um, Indonesia um, explains it's one of its main agenda is actually to increase its participation in the UN peacekeeping. So I look forward to to see how, how it goes um, and whether or not we can achieve these targets. 
Um, and so, therefore, you know, at least us in CSI is really forward to you know having the similar discussions on this topic. And I thank you um, all of the uh, uh, speakers for today's um, um, panel, and please join me in, in appreciate appreciating uh, all the contributions. <laughs> Thank you, honorable speakers and moderator, for a very interesting session on peacekeeping, education, and planning perspective. Uh, now, we would like to invite the Deputy Head of the European Union Delegation to Indonesia, Mr. Charles Michel Gertz, to provide a closing remarks to end this public debate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Am I uh, the last thing that separates you from the weekend? If so, I will be very short and it will be easy to be very short because I think everything has been said today. We have had a very long day, two excellent panel, excellent uh, speakers, and I think indeed that we have learned a lot. So I would like to thank all of the Indonesian speakers, especially this afternoon, Brigadier really General Victor. That's um, mine, and um, uh, the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the, the journalists who would like to go to make it more.
but the added value for the Indonesian Defense University, for the Indonesian Peacekeeping Training Center, is on one hand to benefit our cooperation from creative assets that we have, a very good example has been the European Security and Defense Project, which is a collective asset given EU products, uh, including uh, in cooperation with our third part and third countries like Indonesia. But the second added value is that you have a one-stop shop if the Indonesian Defense University, the Indonesian Peace, the Indonesian Center, wants to engage European partners, whatever they may be, on dedicated training capabilities, not only for those rare assets that we have so much about. Uh, it's easier to contact the EU who will then dispatch that with all its member states and try to see which match can be done. And with potentially also some EU incentives, uh, financially or others, to have the process. So, we do hope after the security dialogue yesterday that we can move uh, into this more operational phase of this cooperation which we have already started uh, several years ago, and that 2019 will be indeed the year of operationalization. Thank you very much. I wish you an excellent weekend. Thank you. Uh, new delegates, speakers, guests, ladies and gentlemen. We have concluded today public dialogue advancing new Indonesia security and defense partnership. Uh, we thank you for coming at this event and we hope to see you again at the future uh, European Union and CSIS event. Um, lastly, uh, the organizer from the EU would request if we all, all speakers, delegates, and uh, also participants to have a group photo together to uh, have a memory of today's event. Thank you.